Hi, good evening. Um, very good evening, everyone. My name is Faith. I'm from World Vision Singapore, and I'll be your MC for the evening. Thank you for taking the time out to join uh, World Vision's Window to My World South Hebron West Bank webinar. I hope you've had an early dinner, if not managed to get some food in front of you while you enjoy today's very exciting and insightful session. As a disclaimer, World Vision remains impartial and neutral. We have signed a code of conduct for the International Red Cross and Red Crescent Movement and NGOs in disaster relief. This code seeks to safeguard high standards of behavior and maintain independence and effectiveness in disaster relief. Our focus is on the well being of children and families we serve on the ground. Finally, if you wish to sponsor a child or have any queries, please feel free to WhatsApp us at 6922-0144 or scan the QR code that you see at the bottom of your screen. My colleagues will be happy to communicate with you over text. So for those of you who may not have heard about World Vision, we are a Christian humanitarian organization operating in nearly 100 countries around the world. We are dedicated to helping the most vulnerable children, even in the most dangerous places, to overcome poverty and experience fullness of life. We serve all people, regardless of religion, race, ethnicity, or gender. In FY20, World Vision Singapore's impact in development and disaster work reached over 1 million beneficiaries, of which more than half are children. Through child sponsorship, children and communities grow and benefit from interventions in five sectors that are fundamental to growth and self-sustainability. Economic livelihood, education, health and nutrition, water, sanitation and hygiene, and child protection. We continue to empower and equip girls and boys, their families and community members in 13 countries across Asia, Africa, and the Middle East to experience life in all its fullness and build resilience against the pandemics and natural disasters. Today in particular, we will be focusing on our South Hebron area program in the Middle East. Geographically, South Hebron is located in the southeastern part of the Hebron district of the West Bank and covers 14 villages as you can see from this map. It is a predominantly rural area with land mainly used for animal herding. There are two main groups, the village dwellers, um, as well as the Bedouins who live a no semi-nomadic life. Most of the area that we serve are located in area C, where the community are subjected to harsh challenges. In 2011, South Hebron was identified as having the most vulnerable communities in the West Bank region. We started work in this area with the goal of contributing to the well-being of children, especially in the areas of health, education and child protection, to enable them to overcome the severe challenges they face. So one of the key challenges identified is um, health and sanitation concerns of which 21% of children under five are anemic, while almost one in 10 children under two are stunted. Sanitation conditions vary with some communities such as the nomadic Bedouin having no toilet facilities at all. One third of schools have very poor sanitary conditions. Healthcare is also in the form of basic mobile health clinics with only one general practitioner, each who, who has to cover several villages at a time. Another significant issue is the, in the community is a lack of access to education and low quality of teaching. 64% of teachers did not receive proper training. Schools are poorly equipped and in some cases classes are held in makeshift tents or containers and caravans. And some schools are far from homes and children need to walk at least five kilometers to attend classes. Child protection remains a challenge due to cultural norms and the fragility and vulnerability that worsen such issues. For example, 77% of adolescents reported having experienced physical violence and or psychological aggression in the past 12 months, while only 35% of caregivers and 15% of students are able to identify with child-related violation issues. On top of all these challenges, the children living in South Hebron are constantly threatened by fragility, displacement, violence, and more. Recently, we heard news of the conflict. We see pictures of collapsed buildings, bombings, and of people willing. 
These are the reality of the children living in South Hebron, West Bank. People are forced to leave their homes and with limited access to basic needs and an already dire humanitarian situation for millions of people, is now excavated with the rapid spread of the COVID-19 pandemic. Today, we dive deeper to discover and understand the needs on the ground and how World Vision strives to deepen our commitment to the most vulnerable children. Without further ado, I'd like to pass the time to Lillian, who is our National Director of World Vision Singapore, to continue the segment of our fireside chat with our invited guest speakers. Thank you, Faye. And uh, on behalf of World Vision Singapore, I just want to thank everyone who is joining us uh, at this time. And also for those of you who have been journeying with us and sponsoring children in the South Hebron area, a very, very big thank you to all of you. Just want to show our, uh, express our deepest appreciation. Now, let me move on to welcome a very special colleague all the way from Jerusalem. Um, she's none other than Lauren Taylor, who is joining us live this evening. So Lauren, you want to turn on your video. <laughs> Hi everyone. And Lauren has been serving with World Vision for almost uh, 16 years of which the most recent three years uh, she served as for World Vision in JWG uh, otherwise known as Jerusalem, West Bank and Gaza and prior to that um, since 2009 actually she has also been supporting programs in the JWG area first from the World Vision US office and then subsequently from the regional office as well. So welcome Lauren, thank you so much for taking time. What time is it actually in uh, Jerusalem? It's only 2 p.m. here so much earlier than you all, still our work day. <laughs> yeah, so thank you so much for making time. Um, so just want to actually, you know, um, besides thanking you, do you know that you're actually our very first guest on this specially curated webinar series? We titled it Window to My World, the World of the Child and the Children that we serve. And, no, I just learned today. Uh, I know, right? And this webinar actually served to, what we wanted to do with this specially curated uh, webinar series was to really bring to life real stories of children uh, facing real challenges. And, uh, and I think one of the things that we want to be mindful about is to not pretend to claim that we know what the children are going through. And sometimes, you know, we, we can fall into the trap. So we wanted this series to be one where through your sharing, you are able to share with us really what's, what you're witnessing on the ground, what are some of the challenges the, the children and the communities face, and just giving us a glimpse into their world so that we can even begin to understand what they're going through. So maybe first of all, let me just kick off by having our, our, our supporters get to know you better. So 16 years, huh? that's a long time. And three years as national director of JWG, a really uh, challenging and I guess a difficult area. So no mean feat at all. So maybe you want to share with us uh, and our supporters, what inspired you to join World Vision and to ultimately be, be located in the JWG area? Yeah, yeah. So um, for me, it's always been about World Vision. So I was actually started sponsoring children when I was in college. And when I um, was discerning about you know, what to do with my career, I realized that it was mainly people's basic needs that broke my heart the most. And so the goal was always World Vision. I, used to, I remember in graduate school seeing these commercials from World Vision in the United States asking uh, people to sponsor. And I always, was always thinking, send me, send me. And so I started working um, actually with a secular organization, but I didn't I didn't find it very satisfying. It was a fine organization, but it was mostly driven by government grants and they couldn't really holistically work. They couldn't, you know, sponsorship has such staying power for us. We can really commit and work with children over the, the long term, you know, 10, 15 years. And so for me, and also just the deeper transformation, the holism, the, the role of faith. So that was always my, my longing for world vision. Uh, in terms of Gaza, I actually was on, an eight day uh, silent retreat, which I know sounds crazy. I've only ever done it once. And in the middle of it, I heard uh, very clearly what, what I believe to be God, the Holy Spirit, um, speak to me about Gaza. And I was surprised and I sort of set it aside because I wasn't quite sure what to do with it. And then 10 years later, um, I was working in the regional office and the regional leader asked me to pray about coming here to be the national director. So. I spent about three weeks praying and I just had a really clear sense that I should follow Jesus to Jerusalem. Um, and so I said, yes. And then later I remembered that that time on the eight day retreat and was just, just amazed. 
So that's how I came to both World Vision as well as to be working here. Thank you for, for you know, doing what you do every day. Uh, one of the things that I caught when you were sharing is that, you know, um, it broke your heart when you saw some of the needs. And, uh, and, and it really ties back to what our founder, Bob Pierce, has been uh, saying, you know, his, his famous words, right? To allow our hearts to be broken for what breaks God's. So, you know, I, I know it's going to be a hard one to do, but in 16 years, it's going to be challenging. But what is one incident that really broke your heart and, and it's, it just left an unforgettable imprint in your minds. Do you wanna share that? I know it's hard, but one. Yeah, yeah, you're right, it's hard because there's so many, especially because I've worked all over the world. But um, you know, the one that comes to mind from here is actually about um, a year or so ago, right before uh, COVID-19, we had our partnership leader uh, for field operations coming to visit. So he's basically in charge of all the regional offices and the national offices, and he's, he's my boss's boss. So we set up a visit for him and we took him to a school in Nablus. And we were going to show him this project that we have that I, it's one of my favorite projects. It installs solar, span, solar panels on schools. And the thing about that is that uh, they don't have consistent electricity here. And a lot of the schools, um, are disadvantaged. So the solar panel project actually gives schools consistent electricity, it reduces carbon emissions, but it also very much um, teaches girls and boys about science and engineering. And so we were visiting the school and there's a formal presentation. We were down in like one of the main classrooms and the uh, it was a girls school and the girls were presenting about the project. We had just finished and we were gonna go up to the roof to actually see the solar panels and the girls were gonna to present to us, these adolescent girls were gonna present about their science and engineering projects. Uh, but as we were getting ready to leave, this, this young girl, she turned out to be 11, but she was so petite, she looked younger than 11. She actually came up to JBK and she almost like, like tugged on his sleeve. And she said that she wanted to tell him her story and we were surprised because we didn't ask her to share. And also she was so bold and yet so petite that you know, we were wondering what was gonna happen. So a teacher translated for her and she turned out to share that about a month before JBK came, there was a pretty se serious security incident in uh, Ramallah Nablus area. And there was a very intensive security engagement and soldiers were basically looking for a perpetrator. And so they actually, stormed the school and they had thrown tear gas into the school. And this little 11 year old girl, very short, JBK is very tall, is looking up at him and she says, I didn't know that when you encounter tear gas, you're supposed to, to leave the building. She said, so I panicked and I, I fell on the floor. And as a result, her lungs experienced some damage and she ended up in the hospital. So what impacts me most, and I think why it's coming to mind now, is that for one, you know, she was so desiring to tell her story, yet at the same time, I have never seen such fear and terror in a child's eyes. And that look of fear and terror has stayed with me. And I turned to our staff and I was like, we have to get her counseling. Like we have to make sure she gets into one of our psychosocial support programs because she's in, she's in desperate need of counseling. And the other piece that stood with me was what she said. She said, I didn't know, you know, that I was, I didn't know how to handle tear gas. And I thought in my mind, what 11 year old should know how to handle tear gas? Like that, that's just not okay. But it's, yeah, so um, yeah, I'm trying to also, uh, yeah, I can, I can just imagine the child walking out and I, I know JBK is really tall. JBK, by the way, is a is a a, a short form for um, for the, the name of uh, Lawrence Boss, and so yeah, he's this tall African guy. So I can I can imagine this tall guy and this little girl, and who's brave enough and bold enough to go and say that yeah, this is this is what happened. And and you're absolutely right. Why should an 11 year old have to figure out or even understand what to do when there's tear gas? Right, so yeah, they should be figuring out which toy they, they prefer. So you know, in in you know, so yeah, thank you, Lauren, for sharing that. It is it is a very uh, uh, difficult story, um, but I'm glad that uh, you immediately responded and and checked with the staff to see what we can do to actually help and support the, the child. 
And you know, one of the vision that uh, actually our vision at World Vision that we all share is a, a world where children have the ability to live life in all its fullness, where children should be able to feel safe, uh, where, they, where they can actually um, grow up uh, and experience what childhood is like, one that is not filled with fear and uncertainty. So just, you know, I, I know it's going to be challenging and it's, it's also challenging for us as staff to hear that as well. But can you just share with us, um, take us through, difficult as it might be, what you and your team are witnessing on the ground, the challenges that children face and their families face, uh, especially living in an area that is fraught with so much conflict and uncertainty. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yes, I think a lot of people's minds go to uh, Gaza and the conditions in Gaza are very horrific, but the conditions in the West Bank are also really bad. Um, and so, you know, there's four words that come to mind immediately for me. It's poverty, vulnerability, fragility, and violence. And with that violence is trauma. So as Faith was sharing at the beginning, you know, South Hebron is actually one of our uh, most fragile areas. So we work in about 150 villages, but most of the villages of South Hebron fall within our 17 most fragile locations. And as Faith said, it's a very rural area. Um, a lot of Bedouin who live there. And um, 14 of, or sorry, of the 14 villages, there are six that we really think of as what we call surviving. And Yvonne, our operations director, is going to talk about that a little bit more later. But really, these are areas where people have known an intense amount of trauma, an intense amount of stress. Um, they've known a lot of conflict. They tend to be fractured communities. So there's not a lot of social cohesion there. Um, and they're sometimes there tends to be also some radicalization as a result of the trauma, the violence and the ongoing and the ongoing conflict. So this photo here is actually the home of a Bedouin family in, in South Hebron in an AP family, actually a family of a sponsored child. And as you can see, it's, it's quite vulnerable. And the challenge is, is, you know, the Bedouins used to be nomadic, um, but because they live in Area C where there's all these restrictions, military operations, constraints on who's allowed to live where because there's such conflict that happens there, they've been asked to you know, be stationary. And so that's also contributed to challenging their way of life and creating a lot of uh, you know, lack of cohesion, creating a lot of uncertainty and, and vulnerability. Um, and in these communities, a lot of times the men prefer to keep the women at home. So when we once, I once met with a family in this house and only the women's staff were allowed to go in, the men's staff weren't allowed to go in. So it can tend to be a bit, a bit conservative. But also, you know, if we go to the next picture, um, the thing about Area C, which Faith also mentioned, is that area is a particular designation and it's substantially, it's a lot of families with Palestinian families with land, but it's actually the rules and it's governed um, by Israelis and it's, it's under occupation. And there's lots of rules around actually who can build and who can't build. So I think if we just go back one photo before Faith, um, you can see that there's, oh, sorry, it is the next one. <laughs> sorry about that. You can see that for families, sometimes they own land, but they're not allowed to build a house. So something is simple, like they're just not allowed to build a house. They need a special permit and the permits are never given. So you'll find families that live in tents or if they build a house and they don't have permission, then that house will be demolished. And so children here have seen their, their actual homes demolished, they, their toys taken away. You see kids picking through the rubble, looking for their toys. You know, COVID-19, we're told to stay at home and be safe in our homes. Um, and if you think about, you know, if our listeners think about where do you feel most safe? Most people would say, in their home. And yet in this place, you know, homes aren't, they're not, they're not safe. Um, and if you're living in a tent, sometimes your tent's not safe. The uh, military might take your tent away. In this particular family, it's also um, for registered, uh, some sponsored children live there. Um, you know, we've worked with the mother on many, many different interventions. But one of the issues is that she lacks firewood sometimes in the winter. So she burns plastic. And, you know, that is so bad for a child's health. And it, it gets cold here and it snows. I know we don't think about that with the Middle East, but it gets really cold and it, it can snow. So I think there's another photo we could go to as well. So the, it's also, as we said, it's, it's remote. So children have to walk pretty far distances to school, a few kilometers. Now, exercise is good for kids, but, you know, it's a conflict setting. Um, and a lot of times there's Israeli settlers and Palestinians living side by side. 
and that creates conflict. And sometimes like some of these little that they've had dogs chasing after them on purpose, like settlers will send their dogs after them. Um, they don't feel safe. Sometimes they have points and be searched by soldiers, including their bags. Sometimes soldiers that escort them through, through settlements. Um, a lot of trauma, you know, there's a lot of a need for psychosocial support at a time, even just teaching teachers psychological first aid to recognize signs of trauma in children. And it can lead, um, it can also lead to child labor. But for dropout, uh, conservative society, they're in particular very concerned about adolescent girls. Their photos to be taken, they don't want them to be unsafe. And so if the parents will often choose for the girl to drop out, um, be safe at home. And sometimes they choose early marriage, you know, for poor age. age. Um, and in their mind, that's how they keep her safe in a context like this. Yeah. Yeah, actually, and one of the things that we've, uh, one of the reasons that, that we saw was that, you know, um, that uh, there's a potential that will actually be uh, given away as, uh, as just because of um, COVID in the next two years. That's kind of the problem. Jin, what you're saying is, is just, it's just affirming that. I think it keeps them safe. And the other challenge is to the schools. So the schools where we have a lot of sponsored children, it's in the Z village. Picture that shows a bit more of the, uh, of the landscape, but basically, because of this inability to build, when schools are built, they're all this kind of makeshift mobile they, uh, material. Uh, so they're not very sturdy, they're not very strong, they're not very greatly cold in the winter time, and they can be demolished. So there's a number of schools that are actually under threat of demolition, and a lot of times, back water. So that's another big area that we focus on as you as um, sanitation hygiene, they're not allowed to drill under occupation. So as a result, all the water has to be brought in, which is an and a logistical issue. Um, and also then to, um, you know, we uh, just make sure that there's working wash facilities in school so children can do because washing their hands and they're usually outside. Schools are just so basic in what they're allowed to construct and what they're what they're allowed to. Do. Sometimes they don't have fences and there's wild animals in the area. When they're playing outside. It's very hot, so we need to you know give them some sun. Times um, you know there's also been attacks on schools, either the case of the story that I told you about before, or sometimes even settlers come in. And so it's 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 a very harsh environment for sure. This picture that shows the structures behind the children, that's mm -hmm. the caravan. Is that, is that what it means? Yes, exactly. Exactly. And some. Um, I think there was some permission to do a little bit more building, just be like a um, like a mobile unit, you know, like a like a trailer. Street. Um, and they try to expand classroom space with that. I, I, I can imagine as you're as you're just narrating. You know, being a the I know what the life of a child is like. You know, just not know up in the next morning and you go to school whether the school is even there, and then the journey, the kilometers walk to the school itself is in danger. So it's not um a very enviable as a child. Yeah, exactly. And you know that tear gas story, like it happens a lot here. It, it sticks in my mind because of the terror in her eyes, but I've had many children, sweet, like six, seven-year-old boys tell me about tear gas because a home is being demolished next door during school hours, you know, not even, you know, waiting till school ends. And the villages where we work and, and your sponsors sponsor children, which I'm so, um, it was just four caravans and one of them was, uh, about a year ago by the Israeli authorities. So it's like you only have the school and one of them is, is gone.
So, you know, one of the, the uh, I think the next picture that uh, that uh, Faith is going to be showing is a story that I think broke our hearts when we when we had our first uh, um, session with you and we're just trying to understand what's happening on the ground, especially with some of the recent issues. Um, and when you told the story of five-year-old Dima, I think the whole, the whole of the team that was on the call with your team was just, we just went silent. Yeah, talk about Bob Spears, as you mentioned before, the things that break the heart of God. So this photo was taken two days after the May ceasefire. Um, I think it was May 23rd it was taken. And basically what happened is that, uh, and I, my heart was broken too as I heard staff tell me the story. Uh, Dima was home alone with her grandmother. She's from a village in uh, south of Yata. And again, she's a sponsored child. And uh, soldiers were looking for potential rock throwers. Uh, so youth or, or someone who had thrown rocks, maybe they threw them at settlers, maybe they threw them at, oh, it's, it's really hard to, to tell sometimes. So they came running into the house, instead of just coming through the door, you know, five-year-old Dima and her grandmother, and for whatever, took the butt of his gun and which is just heartbreaking. I don't know why a soldier needs to defend themselves against the that happened. Um, now, thankfully, she's okay now about if there's gonna be any long-term implications from that. But still, I mean, she's five, how traumatic. How traumatic to have soldiers, but how traumatic to be, to be hit up in a context where you know, soldiers and police are supposed to keep you safe. Um, so it's, you know, pretty traumatic. Yeah. And I, I, don't, I don't think that she will ever forget. And it will, it will leave, a, I think, a, a very long-term um, um, unforgettable memory for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. You know? One of the things that is also encouraging despite all these incidents is the fact that, you know, every time when uh, you and your team hear about stories like that or when you encounter a story like that, we do respond and we, we, we try to make good and repair what we can so that you know children can go on to live lives as children right so i know that you have a, a quick rapid assessment that's conducted in may and some of the data points are not encouraging to see you know when you see things like 53 percent of the central villages reported high incidence of uh, physical violence and one of this is the story that you just told but i think it's also very encouraging that every time we encounter an incident we do something about it so maybe just Help us understand when, what is World Vision doing on the ground when, when we encounter things like that? So how do we help to make sure that, you know, children get their lives back? Yeah, absolutely. So the beauty of sponsorship is it's such a beautiful, um, consistent, faithful funding stream. And it al allows us to do emergency, immediate response, um, even for particular children in need, as well as it allows us to do um, long-term responses. And so as a result of that, um, we have a program where we are focused, I would say, in three core areas, um, early childhood development. Uh, the second one is child protection and advocacy. And the third one is in community resilience. And so we can, we can unpack each of those. So perhaps we can start with early childhood development. Um, so the, the science is really, really clear. And there's a good study in the Lancet years ago that said that if you don't properly help a child's cognitive and neurological development by the age of six, then they will forever earn 25% less every year for the rest of their lives. So if you don't help a child when they are zero to six, even when they're still in the womb with the right um, social, emotional and health development, then they are gonna be only, only earning 75% of their potential. Now, 75% of your potential in a conflict environment is pretty, is pretty low and it leads to it leads to you know significant poverty. So we have two project models that we use. One is called Go Baby Go. And Go Baby Go is an evidence-based project model. We developed it with the Gates Foundation and it's actually really quite simple. What it does is it trains community health workers from the villages who work very closely with mothers during their pregnancy and during the first 1000 days of a child's life. And what they do is they provide basic health information, what you do when you're during pregnancy, what do you do, how do you care for the child after pregnancy, as well as the importance of 
um, the child's social emotional development, singing to the baby, reading to the, to the baby, talking to the baby, holding the baby. Now, these things probably seem very, very simple because they're second nature to most people, particularly in you know, developed societies. But you have to understand that here, there's two issues. There is a lot of poverty and lack of knowledge. So there's not, you know, there's only a mobile clinic once a week in a lot of these communities and they live very vulnerable lives. And two, there's a lot of what, for my culture, we would call wives tales, old wives tales. I don't know if you have those in, in Singapore culture, but basically breastfeeding isn't good. Don't pick up the baby too much. You'll spoil it. There's no need to hold the baby. All you need to do is this and that. Put salt on the baby when it's born, put coal under its eyes, like a lot of things like that. So we work very, very closely with the mothers. And so in South Hebron, you know, it's the baseline of children who were developmentally on track was only 57% in all domains like gross motor skills, communication, social emotional learning, and so forth. And so um, now after this intervention, we recently got the data, 93.9% of the babies that are part of this program are now developmentally on track, which just makes me tear up. I just think that's one of the most amazing things ever that it's so simple. As long as a mother has the right knowledge, she can make sure that her baby is healthy and developed and the women love it. So I was in South Hebron about a year ago and um, I was meeting with mothers who are part of Go Baby Go. And I said to them, I, we had five minutes left. And I said, well, tell me what you've learned the room erupted and a half hour later, they were still talking about all the science, everything that they do, how they've changed their husbands, they've changed their mother-in-laws and they just were like, like one after another. And they're like, let me tell you this and let me tell you that. And I just, I was laughing with joy. You couldn't help it. The room was contagious. And finally I was like, I have to go, but it was absolutely amazing. And so it's, it's such a gift to even pass that story on to your sponsors because they're the ones making that happen, right? Like they're the ones providing the resources for it. And I'm sitting in this room and it was just, you know, harsh conditions, but it was, it was just all, joy and delight. Thank you for sharing that story. I was just thinking when I was smiling very quickly, I said, oh, and they were talking about how they changed their husbands and their mother-in-laws. And I was like, mm, okay, there's something there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, but we don't stop there. We, we continue with children uh, in the next phase of life. So we have another project model that we call learning roots. So here I am, I'm meeting with some uh, government officials and with the school and the teachers telling us about how this project model has changed her classroom. So learning roots, it's very, very similar. So this photo might not mean anything to someone from a developed country, right? A, a kindergarten with a colorful table, pictures on the wall, not a big deal. But if you were to see these classrooms beforehand, blank walls, simply normal desks and teaching styles that were very like, you know, re share and repeat, not interactive, not colorful or anything like that. And I love learning roots because we work in partnership with the Ministry of Education and basically it transforms uh, classrooms. Uh, it transforms the physical environment, makes them safe, secure, colorful. It teaches both parents and teachers how to develop educational toys from local products. So for example, I have sat and created Arabic letters and numbers with bottle caps with five-year-olds. Um, and it taught teachers an interactive learning style and it also addresses issues of physical um, discipline. So trying to take away sort of unhealthy discipline practices that aren't good for children. So we just, this data is hot off the press. Um, <laughs> The, uh, so the baseline for the communities that we measured overall in Hebron, South Hebron, it's 57% of children that are on track in all domains for early childhood development. For this particular community that we were measuring, it was 63%. And in a year with COVID, with all the disruptions, or sorry, 50, sorry, 55%, let me get my stats right. It was even lower than the, the overall South Hebron baseline. It was only 55%. And with all the disruptions of COVID, we still now have 77% um, of five-year-olds on track in all domains. And early literacy and early numeracy went up 20 points each. So super, super excited about early childhood development in South Hebron. Yeah, and, and you know, um, the, the sharing of what you, you just went through on Go Baby Go and Learning Roots, it, it really res resonates with uh, parents in Asia and in Singapore especially. And we are 
fully aware that you know the development of a child before five years old is so critical. So you'll find that actually parents in, in Singapore, not just Singapore, actually Asia, invest a lot of time and resources in making sure that the children get equipped, they get uh, all kinds of uh, uh, training or, or extra lessons around motor skills, uh, creative skills, and so on and so forth. So, so thank you for doing what you do. And it, thank you for sharing the results. I think it's very encouraging that it's true it, despite the, the circumstances, despite COVID, um, these are really nice. 20 points. Okay, okay man. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So we're excited too, definitely. Yeah. So switching gears a little bit, I'm, I'm, I'm just um, thinking through the, the story that you shared of Dima. And, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of, uh, clearly a lot of child protection issues as well. And uh, the rapid assessments also show that. So maybe you want to share a little bit with us in terms of what we're doing, what we're doing around child protection. How do we give voice to the voiceless? Yeah. Uh, and the incident with JBK was obviously uh, one that's very telling, right? So how do we actually give uh, children who's going through this a voice? Yeah, yeah. So this is another reason why I'm really grateful for sponsorship funding, because it enables us to invest long term. And honestly, for child protection, we, we need a long term intervention. Um, it's, it's for many reasons. I mean, the, the area that the word that comes to mind that really affects the protection of children is the violence and it's violence in all shapes and forms. So there's there's actually a lot of violence within Palestinian society um, culturally, but also they're stressed. You know, and you know when mothers are stressed, when parents are stressed, they tend to, you know, re react in unhealthy ways. And violence, both psychological violence as well as physical violence. Um, there's violence in schools, disciplinary techniques of teachers, as I was just mentioning, but also peer-to-peer -peer violence. And there can also be clan violence, so family disputes, um, clans that, and and because there's also some really harsh issues in some communities where there's some arms dealing. There can be clashes between you know the arms dealers, so it's, it's it's not an easy environment for a child in any shape or form. And then you add occupation, conflict with settlers, conflict with Israeli military, and it's it is a very it is a very traumatic and violent environment. So, you know, World Vision believes that if you're really going to change child protection behaviors, systems, attitudes, norms, you you have to work holistically. So, we work with children, with families with the community and with the system itself. And so this photo here is an example of how we work with children. So, you know, uh, Faith had mentioned in the beginning that only 15.4% of the children in South Hebron know what their rights are. And if you don't know what your rights are, you, you don't know when you're being violated. So you don't report, right? You just live with it. You think it's normal because it's all you've ever known. Uh, and when we talk to caregivers, only 35% of caregivers um, understand what child's rights are. Now, just to give you some perspective, our baseline for all of West Bank, that number is at 43 um, or 47%. I can't remember exactly right now, but South Hebron is at 35%. So this is the child protection statistics are, are even worse. So with children, it's about teaching them their rights, but it's also about teaching them their life skills. So we're starting a new intervention next year um, for kids clubs that are gonna teach children social emotional learning. So basic things like you know, self-awareness and emotional management and decision-making. Um, you know, if kids are gonna grow up to be a positive agent of change, they have to learn how to manage their emotions. And it's hard you know, with what they see day in and day out. Um, we also work in the high schools with student parliaments. We work with uh, youth through something called impact clubs. And they're all about teaching kids leadership development, uh, you know, a chance to be an agent of change in their community about their rights. Sometimes that comes in the form of summer camps. Um, so when you see, you know, something in your sponsor material that says your child was in a summer camp, you might not think that's huge, but here it's huge because it's safe play and they have a chance to really learn critical life skills that they're, that they're not getting in a, in a safe environment. But with the parents, we also have something called positive discipline. And we do these workshops with mothers that teach them about, um, you know, what are more positive ways to raise up your child. A lot of mothers here believe that uh, like deprivation and violence and physical violence and physical pun punishment are necessary to bring up a child. And so we try to teach them differently. And we're rolling out a new project model called Celebrating Families. It's contextualized to work with either Christian or Muslim families. 
And it's about strengthening the family, you know, helping the family talk to each other and to design, you know, the family that they want to be. We are starting community groups that work on um, helping uh, communities recognize violence and uh, have community responses to promoting healthy environments for children. Um, start to address issues of early marriage, um, have discussions about you know, school dropout and things like that. Um, and then finally, we also work with the government to try to strengthen the child protection system. The government is, you know, they're interested, they're willing, but they're under-resourced. So things as common as social workers are really lacking here. So there's referral networks that we're trying to get in place. So when a child does experience violence, that there's a local solution to managing their care and responding to those, to those urgent needs. So I don't have impact data for you on all of these uh, project areas today, in part because COVID has really disrupted them, but uh, we have a long way to go. So uh, we, need, we need time um, to really try to have uh, the impact that we hope for and really try to address these, these cultural norms. I'm going to tap on that, the point that you mentioned about COVID, right? I mean, like we cannot, if you come kind of mention it a couple of times and, and COVID, it opens up opportunities, but it's also obviously a very uh, a, a very big setback as well. Can you share with us a little bit about what we're doing on the ground with respect to COVID? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's changed a lot because it's changed as, as the world has learned about COVID-19. Um, but in the beginning, we did a lot to support the quarantine centers that are available for these communities to make sure that they um, like even small things, like people were put in quarantine centers without kitchens, you know, so even just making sure, or they didn't have enough masks, or they didn't have enough um, PPEs, or they didn't have enough uh, disinfectant and so forth. So in the beginning, it was a lot of masks, gloves, disinfectant, and just supplies to outfit quarantine centers. From there, we moved into equipping village councils. So um, all the village councils and village committees, um, as well as the schools received packages to make sure that schools are safe and community areas are safe. And so again, it was a lot of um, personal protective equipment, gloves, masks, disinfectant, and so forth. Um, eventually we started to adapt our programming as well to be online. And one of the, we did a lot of the workshops I've been talking about online. School activities were really halted and those we've been trying to catch up with those this year as schools have been open, but we were able to do a lot, particularly with, um, psychosocial support. So a lot of uh, just counseling available, training messages on social media. We participated in a big UN social media campaign uh, that to really help share knowledge about what the actual coronavirus is, debunk myths, um, tell them where they can get help uh, and provide messages about how to manage home, how to manage your children, how to manage stress. Um, schools have been very disrupted here because there isn't the internet connectivity and so forth. And so we're still trying to figure out, you know, what are some of the ways that we might be able to, to support in that regard. And since we've been back in schools, another big area for us under community resilience is disaster risk preparedness and education and emergencies. And so that's where we've been making sure that schools are safe, you know, for COVID, but other issues. Some of them don't even have fire extinguishers. Some of them don't have school safety plans. Um, We've done a lot to do um, just community preparedness planning um, and an overall uh, water and, and sanitation and hygiene facilities at school so kids can you know, properly wash their hands. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing and, and, and just you know, getting a sense of what it means on the ground. Because sometimes when, when we read the reports, uh, like as you rightly pointed out, like summer camps and, and you, and summer camp conjures a certain image when you're living in Singapore versus when summer camp, when you're living in JWG or summer camp in the US, right? So, so it's, it's this, this series of webinars that we're trying to bring this to life. Like summer camp is not your version of summer camp. And it's really a, a safe place where children can be children and they don't have to worry about somebody coming in and, and taking away their toys or demolishing what they already have. So thank you so much for sharing. Faith, I'm just going to ask if you can go back to the previous slide because uh, when Lauren was sharing and I was just looking at this girl holding the mic and I was just thinking, you know, this girl has so much potential and she looked like she could be a doctor, she could be a lawyer, she could be so much, right, that, uh, that she can dare to dream and be. And the only difference is that she's born where she is born. Yeah. And 
that is and that can be and and that can be quite a, a sad thing right so and with child sponsorship one of the things that we we did discuss and we it's a vision and a mandate for world vision is how do we actually allow children the opportunities to realize their potential and to to dream again so just wondering despite all the challenges that you've shared and the work that the team is doing on the ground can you share with us a little bit about um uh child sponsorship and and how has is that changing lives of children like these children that are here in this picture yeah absolutely so you know, first of all, I just want to thank all the sponsors that are on here. I mean, you can't even begin to imagine the difference that you're making. I mean, if it wasn't for you, we wouldn't be doing anything, right? Those those babies would still not be, you know, having the appropriate brain development. Children would not be empowered. Um, and it's not just that. I mean, it's also the fact that uh, we can work holistically. Um, we can work with freedom. And what I mean by that is, you know, a lot of my, my social network here is other country, country directors of other organizations. And, you know, they really struggle. They get these government grants. And we all love government grants. They're great. But, you know, they come in and they do one thing for a short amount of time and they're gone. But the amazing thing about sponsorship is that we're with these communities in, in, with this, this resource that enables us to both address the needs of children, but also make enhancements to the community. And so we, we can be there for the long term and, and we don't go away. You know, politics will come and go. Issues will affect government funding, but World Vision is able to, uh, you know, maintain its neutrality, maintain its independence and just do what we know is right. For the well-being of children and the things that we believe with our with our mission that we are supposed to be doing and so i see it making a difference in children's lives every single day you know they you know small things you know a letter from a sponsor can be transformative um, a child receiving a gift notification you know a gift from somebody and it, it's a toy they didn't they wouldn't have had before um, and also just they're finding their voice you know and in Palestine, you know, uh, they do a lot of these morning exercises with the microphone, you know, and they're finding their voice and they're becoming champions about, about human rights, about, you know, decisions that should be made for the well-being of children, about how children should be safe. There, there are messages, positive messages to their teachers, their school administrators, and so forth. And so for me, sponsorship's amazing because we can do something directly for the child but then we can also look at the child's environment and make sure that it's an environment that can nurture a child and can help that children develop, whether it's their family or whether it's their school. And we can build that community's resilience. So when all these shocks we've been talking about come in, that the community has ability to manage that shock and bounce back and recover from it as, as, as much as possible. And so, you know, you might not see the same level of change um, physically that you might see in a, in a non-conflict country, maybe, you know, somewhere in uh, Zambia, um, but you will definitely see resilient people who have better knowledge, change behavior, better ability to care for their family, better desire to care for their family, schools that are better equipped, village councils that are better um, developed to really prioritize and care for the well-being of children. So I'm so grateful. I'm a sponsor myself. I sponsor two children in uh, JWG in Jerusalem, West Benghazi, and I sponsor one in Albania. And so I hope that that's a, a, a encouraging word to all of you that I really believe, I really believe in the model. And I, I thank God for you guys all the time as I'm driving in the field. And I just think, I just wish sponsors could see this themselves because they, they are the reason we make a difference every day. Yeah. And actually, I, I echo that as well, because I have a, a sponsored girl in a JWG area as well. And just receiving her photo and seeing that big, bright smile, it does. So, yeah, thank you so much for, you know, for, for giving them hope. I think the other one that you wanted to, uh, to also, um, you know, be able to deliver through the work of World Vision is really just that children have hope. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So on our strategy, this current strategy cycle we're in, which goes down through 20 to 2024, is we have three words that we constantly draw staff back to, resilience, nurture, and hope. And um, for, for those that are, that are listening uh, who come from a Christian background, our verse that inspires our strategy actually comes from Jeremiah. And it's the verse that talks about like how trees are planted by the water, that they, even in a time of drought, they can still bear fruit. 
And, and that's our goal as World Vision in Jerusalem, West Bank, Gaza. We want to plant children by water. You know, we want to make sure that they are nourished and they grow. So even in times of drought, even in the conflict, even in the escalations, even in all the hardships, that they are able to still bear, bear fruit. And that is our, that is our desire. And um, I think one of the most appropriate way to kind of come to a roundup of this segment is um, you, you and your team prepared a very nice uh, community video. And I thought maybe I'll let you introduce that. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So one of the things that World Vision promises to sponsors is an annual community update. We want you to know what's been happening. So you're gonna see some of our staff. You're gonna see Nader, he looks a little nervous actually. Um, and you're gonna see Fatson who led our COVID-19 programming and you're gonna be able to hear from a sponsored child and you're gonna be able to hear from um, other members of the community to see what we were doing in FY20. There's a heavy focus on COVID because of course that was everyone's reality in FY20, but at least you get a chance to see even more of the community and see some of our staff who are doing amazing work on the ground all the time, but mostly just to hear from some of the children. And we, I think we have more of that today in the webinar as well. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, so maybe we should now watch the video. And yes, Nada is really nervous. I, I, can, I can see that. <laughs> Hello, I'm Nader Rahil, South Hebron Area Program Manager. Before COVID-19, we have worked on empowering children through youth clubs and student parliaments, as well as the community groups, partners, mothers, for better protection of their children. We are making the biggest differences in our vulnerable communities by being one of the first responders to COVID-19 crisis in terms of providing them with essential health information individual psychosocial support, and personal protective material to protect them from COVID-19. Our interventions benefited around 50,000 people in our community. After the community recovers from COVID-19, we are looking forward to continue our work, maintain our psychosocial support, and gradually return to implement our activities. We will also conduct extracurricular activities at schools to help children get rid of the negative side effects of home quarantine and restore the relationships between students, teachers, schools, and world vision. أنا اسمي بهاء الدين من منطقة جنوب الخليج. أنا عمري 15 سنة في الصف التاسع. أنا وأهلي وأصدقائي استفدنا كثيرا من منشورات التوعية المنتظمة التي تقوم مؤسسة الرؤية العالمية بنشرها من خلال صفحة الفيسبوك، حيث قدمت لنا المعلومات الصحيحة عن كورونا فيروس والإجراءات والنصائح السليمة التي يجب اتباعها. مثل غسل اليدين دائما بالماء والصابون وتعقيمها كما أصبحنا نحافظ على التباعد الاجتماعي ولبس الكمامات من ناحية أخرى مؤسسة الرؤية العالمية قدمت لقريتنا وللقرى المجاورة مواد تعقيم لاتخاذ التدابير اللازمة في القرية Thank you sponsors Uh, I just want to say thank you again to Lauren, uh, but at this time, I'd like to welcome another very special guest. He is none other than Ivan Castro, who is from uh, he's the operations director for the JWG area. And I think in preparation for this webinar, he's been gathering stories of children and the families. And obviously, as you've heard from both Lauren and Faith, that uh, the, the generally is a very conservative culture. So, so I think gathering the stories has its challenges, but we just wanna thank you for, for bringing stories to us live from, um, from the community that we are serving. So thank you so much, Ivan. Ivan, just wanna kick off by maybe asking uh, a question, right? So one of the things in our earlier sharing uh, where you shared is that World Vision uh, Singapore is actually supporting the area where it comprises of 14, one, four villages, and of which six is termed as surviving. Can you share with us a little bit more about what do you mean by surviving villages and uh, so that, you know, our sponsors and our supporters can understand it? Thank you, Lillian. <clears throat> Just to introduce myself also, uh, I am originally from Latin America. And uh, I spent more than five years working for World Vision. And I have more than 25 years of experience working in development. And I would like to mention also to our friends who are uh, listening to this uh, webinar that for me, it's like a ministry. Uh, my work is, I enjoy my work and I enjoy when I arrived here just five months ago to work in, in West Bank and to be in Jerusalem with my wife 
uh, uh, trying to help the people and the living conditions of the children in uh, West Bank. Uh, now I would like to everyone to accompany in this uh, trip that we plan to, to, to do. Uh, the map that we have here uh, is uh, the map that uh, show the 14 villages that uh, you already mentioned, uh, Lily. Uh, these 14 villages are uh, in, the, in the south of Hebron. And as you already mentioned, there are uh, six out of 14 villages that they are called uh, surviving. Uh, when we talk about surviving, we need to explain that there is some countries in the world that are selected as fragile contexts, in fragile contexts. And when we talk about fragile contexts, we are talking about uh, countries who have violence inside, who have conflicts, and also who have some disasters, and the uh, children are living in a very critical situation. Maybe the, the worst places where a children should be born is in those uh, fragile uh, contexts and countries. Uh, in this case, Palestine or West Bank is a fragile context. Then a uh, world vision has developed a framework uh, we call the fragile context framework. And in the fra fragile context framework, we have selected or we uh, apply 10 factors in order to uh, select the villages by uh, the fragility. And one of the lowest level of fragility is surviving. That means that they are living in contact, con constant crisis, that they are living in volatility and violence. The next level, is a adaptation and the next level is thriving. Then what we do as an organization is we need to identify uh, when we go to one village, which level, in which level of fragility this village is. I can tell you, Lillian, I, I, tra I travel a lot, but also work in different, in different countries. I used to work in Nepal and in India and in Philippines, also in Latin America, but uh, I make the, some field visits uh, here in, in West Van, and I saw that these six uh, villages where we are working are really surviving. They are really in the bottom of the, uh, how can I say, the ranking, and uh, you know, they are really in a very big need. Uh, that is why uh, in the map, we see these uh, six villages in red and the one in, in the south part of this map uh, with some uh, lines is the, the one that we visit. Yeah, so, so actually, uh, Ivan, one of the things that uh, really uh, motivated us to want to uh, kick off this series with the JWG um, area program was because of exactly this map, right? So I remember the time when it was just two officers coming together and we were looking at the, the map and I remember Lauren was walking through this, um, the mapping and the fragility and, and she said, you know what, Lillian, the um, World Vision Singapore is supporting one of the most vulnerable areas uh, in the JWG area. And we said, and when, when she said that, I was thinking to myself, I don't know whether I should be happy or sad. I think happy because we are, we are supporting an area that's, that is really most needful and, and that's staying true to our commitment to deepen our commitment to the most vulnerable. But sad that, you know, we have to be, um, I guess, being, um, I guess, faced with so many needs and challenges. And it's always heartbreaking when these challenges involve children. So thank you for sharing about the, the six surviving villages. And this is something that we wanted to, to share with our supporters that have been journeying with us as well because they have been journeying with us. A lot of them are child sponsors on this, on this webinar. So thank you for sharing. Jo, oh, and I, I, you also have a story that you have actually um, uh, helped to, uh, to gather for us uh, as a result in preparation for this webinar. Um, maybe I'll, I'll leave you to share the story of Lean, who is an 11 year old girl um, living in the South Hebron area. I would like to yeah, introduce the family of Ling. Uh, I, 
I have the privilege to visit uh, her village. Uh, uh, her village is named, uh, the name of her village is Um Alkeir, Um Alkeir, and uh, it's a Bedouin village. This village have around 750 people, according with the information I have received, but the, the houses are really spread in the desert. Uh, when I was traveling there, just to give you some uh, idea, it was 37 degrees Celsius, and we travel uh, the, 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 the city who is close to this place is 12 kilometers far, and you can see in the, in the left side of the map is Jata, and Jata is the closest city uh, that uh, they can go. Also in the north, there is the city of uh, Hebron, it's 20 kilometers far, then uh, you can see that they are living very far from the, how we can say the civilization, uh, but also the Ling, uh, I have the opportunity to, to meet with uh, her parents. Her mother of Ling is a professor and she's uh, teaching in the school. There is a high school, they call high school, but in general the school is kindergarten, primary school, and high school all together from, from the first grade to the 12th grade. And uh, her mother is a teacher there. Uh, her father, uh, I knew uh, for our conversation that, uh, for example, the father lost uh, his job because the COVID uh, restriction and the COVID situation. Uh, she has two sisters, and I have the opportunity to meet also with the uh, uh, the name of Sadin. Sadin is the, the elder one, uh, the sister. And they are really, uh, I think so, they, even though they are living in a very uh, critical condition in this surviving village, but they are a happy family. And that is, uh, I, I can repeat the words that you mentioned, always behind every children, every child, there is a future. And when I ask about the future to them, they were really amazed uh, that they, they have dreams, they want to be something, they want to be doctors, they want to be fashionists. It's interesting how you can see the, the children they can dream and we are working here to make their dreams uh, a reality. Uh, let me, let's go to the, see the video, Lillian. We have a video to introduce okay. the uh, Lynx family. Go ahead. Yeah. اسمي ليان عمري 11 سنة So tell us a little bit about this living conditions. I understand that this picture actually shows um, the actual house uh, that Lian is uh, staying in. Uh, so maybe you wanna um, help us to orientate how this, what this is? Yeah, uh, Lian, uh, this is uh, the gear there uh, is uh, Salim. And uh, you can see outside of her house, uh, one important thing that I can uh, share with you is that uh, you can see the solar, solar panels uh, over one roof. They don't have electricity in their village. Uh, also, they don't have running water uh, or drinking water. Uh, they need to buy water from some uh, cars that they bring the, the water from some distance. Uh, 
Uh, I was asking because always I want to know the cost of the, the living cost. And you know, they mentioned that every cubic meter of, of water is around 30 shekels, which is more than $10. Uh, imagine that they need to pay a lot uh, to have water in, in, the, in this place. Also, they have some uh, issues related with the health because they don't have a, a health center or health services there. And they are struggling because I already mentioned that the closest city uh, is Chata and is 12 kilometers far. And also Hebron in the, in the north is 20 kilometers far. And there is no transportation there. Uh, then it's quite difficult for them if they are sick or they have some problem. Uh, also the Palestinian Ministry of Health, uh, they are the ones who operate the health system and they have some scarcity of resources. Uh, another important point that I would like to mention is because I, in, in another village, I met with the people from Jata, that city, uh, the people from the Ministry of Health, and they mentioned that, the, for example, the principal sickness uh, that they, they record in, in, the, in those areas is related with uh, anemia. 25% uh, of the population have anemia, uh, children under five years old. And also uh, imagine they have some very high uh, ratio or uh, I am talking about the neonatal mortality because you know uh, the lack of service, health services, bring that the, the mortality, the neonatal mortality, that's mean the 28 uh, first days uh, when one child is born is 20, 20 children dead out of 1,000. And maybe it's one of the highest rates. And uh, I, we make our research in our office. And, and just in Israel, it's three. And Singapore is two. But in Palestine and in this place, it's 20. Uh, then the, the, the rate is really high. Yeah. Uh, then they are facing very big challenges. Uh, also with the education, maybe we can see the next picture that we have. Because they have uh, in the village, they need to walk uh, 1.2 kilometers to reach the two high schools, uh, the high schools for uh, boys and the high school for girls. And uh, around in every school, they have 20, 120 students in each one. And there are around 20 teachers in each, in each one. But they have also several needs. Uh, the uh, high school uh, for boys have a kindergarten and the kindergarten also uh, have some needs. As you can see here, the playground uh, needs to be fixed and, and they have several uh, uh, situations, especially with the security. Uh, I record here, in my notes that, for example, what they need in the schools is uh, educational tools uh, to facilitate the professors, the teachers to teach the students. Also, they need some uh, IT supporting equipment, for example, uh, LCD or laptops or desktops. I, I ask, uh, but you, do you have electricity? Because you don't have electricity in the villages. And they mentioned, yeah, in the schools, we have electricity. In that case, we can run, but we need some equipment uh, in our schools. Also, uh, they want to develop some uh, science labs and, and libraries that they don't have. And the kindergarten, uh, they want to have uh, outdoor toys and safe play areas that we can support to them. Mm -hmm. So one of the things every time when World Vision go uh, makes a field trip, right? And unfortunately, uh, with 
the current situation with COVID, we are not able to make a trip out to JWG. But regardless, um, that every time when we go out uh, and we meet with children in the in the area that we work, the question we always ask is when we see children, right, it's like we always go to the operations uh, director, like in this case yourself, and say, Ivan, is this child sponsored? And then I, I understand from Faith that Lynn is sponsored, but she's got two sisters, is it? Jory and uh, Sadim, is it? Yeah, they, in fact, they are three in that family. One is a sponsor and the two others are, uh, we can call available, no? To be a sponsor. Okay. Then okay. if someone of you want to sponsor them, yeah, they will be more than happy because uh, in, in general, they, they, there is a lot of need. And we have already in the map, we show that there are more than 100, maybe 200 uh, child that we can sponsor. In the surviving villages, right? Yeah, when in we the did... surviving villages. Right, right. But uh, remember, Lily, that we are uh, running in the South, uh, in this uh, uh, AP, in this uh, area, uh, 14 villages. Then, right. uh, but six are surviving, but they still, Others are in the adapting uh, phase. Yeah, hmm. understand. Yeah, thank you so much, Ivan. And I think there's another video that you have prepared for us as well. Uh, yeah, that... please, let's see yeah. the video, okay. Yeah, let's see that video. I <laughs> وأحب إني أخلص وأحب إني أكون ناجحة وكبرس دكتورة انبسطت قمت اظني يعني كل شوي امشي عليه العب هل بتنبسطوا لما تلعبوا في حوالين البيوت مثلا في التراب لا ليش؟ آه الاماكن وسخة ما في العب كثير So these are the six. Um, so I think uh, one of the appeal that we would be making on behalf of not just uh, the children that we serve in South Hebron, but also um, on behalf of um, World Vision Singapore as well, we do have a lot of children waiting to be sponsored in the six surviving villages. Of course, uh, Ivan has also shared that we are working in 14 villages. So just want to first of all say thank you for all of you who have been joining with us. But if you feel that you would like to um, extend the support for another child, just uh, let us know. There's a number here. Um, you can WhatsApp to us and uh, we have staff on standby to uh, really help to see if we can get some of the children sponsored. But meantime, I want to bring Lauren back. Uh, Lauren, um, for Q&A, and I understand that we have a very shy audience today. Uh, there are not many questions coming in. Either that or Lauren and Ivan, you guys are doing a great job sharing uh, the stories of what's happening on the ground as well as um, bringing hope to the children that we serve. But I'm uh, just going to pause and see if there's any questions coming through the chat and uh, we'll see if uh, we can have some questions. Let me see. Okay. All right, um, this one I thought is quite a, a, a good one. So um, maybe I'll, I'll have that, I'll uh, have Lauren share a little bit. So this is the question, giving hope to children in the West Bank, what really works in these areas? Because it's mm. tough. Yeah, it is really tough. Um, I mean, children, they tell us that they feel hope actually and this is a really key thing about sponsorship. They tell us that they feel hope when they see that someone outside of the country cares about them. So I think sometimes we downplay writing to our sponsored children. I'm really guilty. I think I've done it once, right? Like I should be writing to children all the time. I work for World Vision. I should be doing it. But um, one of the things that they tell me is that when someone takes an interest in their life who's not from here, it makes them feel very, very special. It makes them feel that someone knows them and cares about them, which I just find the tear up. I just find that remarkable. So that's one way that children feel hope. Another way is when they feel like 
they have a chance to develop and they don't use that word. They don't say, you know, Lauren, I feel, you know, hope when you give me a chance to develop. What they tell us is they say things like, um, I have a talent or I, I've learned that I'm good at this or I realize that I can make a difference in my community. So for example, we have these impact clubs and with the way the youth talk about discovering like the impact clubs are designed to help improve their self-esteem, their self-efficacy and so forth. And what they'll say to us is they say, I wasn't confident before and I'm confident now. I didn't know how to do this and I know how to do this now. And so whenever they receive a skill and whenever they receive a chance to exercise that skill, no matter what it is, they tell us that they feel hope. And mothers you know, express feeling hope when they feel like they can actually care for their children. You know, there's all these constraints, but if suddenly someone comes and equips them with resources, the ability to think through a situation differently or to care for their children in a different way, then they feel hope. And teachers tell us that they feel hope when they see their children learning. So I remember one time, not in South Hebron, but in West Ramallah, I met with a bunch of mothers who have children in learning groups. And they were talking about the difference between their children who went through kindergarten before we changed the kindergarten and those who had a sibling that have now going through the kindergarten and they talk about the transformation that they experienced and they have hope because they see a difference in their child and how their child thinks what they know, how they relate. So for us, hope has become um, expressed in those, in those things. So if you were to maybe look forward a little bit and just say, what do you foresee would be the biggest challenge that you will face and you foresee in this community? In Um El Her or in South Hebron as a whole? Yeah, South Hebron and the area that, uh, that World Vision Singapore works in. Possibly. The biggest challenge that we face is, um, one, it's a big area. So the biggest challenge we face is spending enough time in, you know, in each community. And so we're always looking for ways to, to do that, especially with the constraints of COVID-19. The other challenge, honestly, is the constraints on us because of the conflict and the occupation. You know, when you can't drill a well, like that's, that's difficult. You know, learning, if you can't, you're ready to improve a classroom, but you can't, you can't improve the classroom because they don't have a classroom available and they're not allowed to build one. So those are the challenges that we, that we experience. And we're trying to advocate, talk to government, talk to different stakeholders trying to find a way forward to, to be a voice for communities because World Vision values that as well. So we're relief development and advocacy. And so we're trying very much to advocate where we can for these communities. Um, you know, for them to advocate, it's difficult because sometimes you know, they're advocating with people who they're in conflict with, but World Vision can be an ambassador. We can advocate, we can try to try to get to overcome these challenges. Uh, Lily, uh, may I add something? Uh, <laughs> Yes, also, uh, I would like to add that the, the children who is a sponsor, he feel protected. It's like uh, we, we create a network of protection for the children. And when they feel uh, that the someone is taking care of uh, he or she, you know, they feel really uh, secure and they can continue with their dream they have. Uh, I, I know several stories about children who really never met with their sponsors, but they knew someone is caring no, for them and they progress and they feel protected. Also the other point is, as uh, Lauren mentioned, we strengthen the child protection system in the country. And that is really important through advocacy, through in the, in the community level uh, also. And we try to, to, to protect the children with our uh, monitors in the field, volunteers, and also the parents and the neighbors. They need to work together in order to protect the children. The moment we arrive to one community and they know that we are there, uh, everything changes because they know that there is something good uh, coming to the community. Yeah, very very well put, Ivan. I, I, yeah, I, when you were sharing, right? It just it just I can just imagine the um the community, the family, and the children's faces, right? Just knowing that um they're not forgotten and they're not left behind. That somebody cares. I don't I don't think they're expecting you know dramatic changes, but just knowing that 
someone cares and somebody remembers and they're not forgotten. I think that alone is a very powerful, uh, it's, a, it's a very powerful sense of well-being. And I remember what uh, Lauren shared as well, right? The, the three uh, key areas is just creating a nurturing environment. So nurture was one word that you use. Um, building resilience. Resilient was another word that you use. And I think ultimately it's, it's, it's just bringing hope and giving hope so that children will have the opportunity and the courage and the belief mm -hmm. that they can dream again. I think that that is very powerful. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, Faith has been uh, faithfully putting up uh, some of the pictures of children waiting to be sponsored. And, and she specially selected children from the six surviving villages, or uh, rather six villages that have been termed as surviving, uh, which means that they are really um, the, the most vulnerable of the 14 villages. So if you do feel um, motivated and really inspired to want to sponsor another child, please reach out to our team uh, and that's the WhatsApp number and I'm sure that they'll be very glad to share with you about the children that uh, that is living in those different villages. So um, any, I'm not sure if there are more questions, but um, do if you do have questions uh, and uh, we can definitely come back to you with the answers. But for now, I just want to say thank you on behalf of World Vision Singapore to Lauren and to Ivan for taking time out on your Thursday afternoon to be with us and to share with us and to and really to just bring to life some of the stories that you see and, and what's happening on the ground. Really, really appreciate that. Thank you so very much. Thank you. And maybe I'll just uh, let the two of you wrap up. May, if there's one thing you want to say to our supporters as on this webinar, what would that be, Lauren? And then maybe Ivan. It, it's just, I can't say thank you enough, honestly. I mean, we would not be here doing anything without you. So thank you. <laughs> I echo that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much to everyone. We are taking care of uh, the resources you are providing and we are trying to be stewards with uh, the resources and, and really uh, the needs here are huge. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for doing what you do every day despite the challenges uh, and the, the challenges that you, you see on the ground. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please do extend our thanks to your team as well, Lauren, and uh, your team on the ground. Thank you I so much. Will. They were great in, in helping for this. And I'm sorry that, uh, yeah, I hope that, you know, someday you all get to visit and meet them in person. That would be amazing. So thank um, you so much to, to World Vision today. Singapore, to all the sponsors. We're just really, really grateful for this chance to share with you. Like I said, I see amazing things every day. And I'm so happy that we get to share just a little bit of that here with you today and that you've spent all this time with us listening. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for allowing us a glimpse into the, through a window into their world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lily. Thank, thank you. you. And now maybe if I can switch gears a little bit to share, um, you know, and we are very fortunate in, uh, in the JWG area to be able to do sponsorship of children, but there are many countries that are experiencing the same level of virginity that do not allow, uh, and it's, it's not even possible to do child sponsorship. And I thought it'd be good to share um, about children living in fragile states. And Ivan has spoken to that a little bit. But one of the things that uh, we are seeing in World Vision and uh, some of the stats that's coming through is by 2030, we believe that an estimated 80% of the world's poorest people will be living in those places. And what are some of these places? It would be places like Afghanistan, right? And places like, for example, in uh, um, Ethiopia, for example, that is experiencing a lot of uh, civil unrest and, and conflict and displacement. And also in Rakhine, for example, right, the, in Myanmar, the Rakhine area itself is also experiencing quite a fair bit of uh, fragility. And so one of the things that uh, World Vision Singapore is, uh, is really looking to do is to reach um, more than 1 million children and adults by 2023 um, and just providing life-saving aid just providing dignity and hope for, for more than 1 million children. So we are hoping that uh, through the support of um, supporters like yourself, we are able to, for example, prevent child marriage in Afghanistan. And you've heard about it happening in JWG area. It is very prevalent in Afghanistan, both culturally and also the, 
the, um, the increased vulnerability that is the result of COVID as well has also increased the, the number of child marriages that's happening. So educating girls, providing them uh, the ability to have some knowledge so that they are educated about what their rights are and also being knowledgeable to be able to have some kind of ability to equip themselves with is, is quite key in the work that we are doing in Afghanistan. The other one is in the Rakhine area, we are also ensuring that there is some community support, providing access to, um, for example, uh, nutrition and just wash capability, uh, clean water and so on. So the, the vulnerable in the Rakhine area. And then last but not least, uh, we continue to provide emergency support in the Tigray area in Ethiopia, where um, if uh, those of us who are following the news, you know that uh, Ethiopia is uh, has a lot of internal conflict and unrest, and that has resulted in a lot of people fleeing and, uh, and just leaving their homes because it's not safe anymore. So we are providing uh, a lot of life-saving aid. So just having uh, dry biscuits and, and just water so that they can continue to at least have some, um, some basic needs being met. So these are some of the things that we are doing. And, in, and Children in Crisis is a fund that we hope to continue to uh, stand alongside uh, children and families that are living in these fragile states and hoping that in the process of the work that we do with your support, we'll be able to um, help children and families survive, recover, and ultimately be able to build a future. So this, this is one, these are some of the countries where we don't do uh, child sponsorship and we can't because it's just uh, not possible given the fragility. So these are some of the ways that you can uh, journey with us and you can uh, work with us in supporting children living in these dangerous places. And same, if you are interested and you wanna find out more about what we are doing and the depth of our work, please uh, do WhatsApp to the team and the number that we have and we'll be happy to share more about the work that we're doing in these areas and be happy to answer questions that you might have. So again, on behalf of all of us at World Vision, I do not take for granted or lightly the, the support that each of you give uh, in journeying with us in the child's life, making a change in, in just one child at a time. I think it makes a lot of difference like what Lauren has also shared. And uh, just want to say thank you very much. And we do deeply appreciate your support. And we hope that this session has also helped to uh, encourage you just as it has encouraged us that you know we are there um, with the children and uh, we stay. We don't want to leave them as much as we can. We want to journey with them. So thank you very much. And I want to hand the time back to Faith. Oh, yes, Faith. Uh, let me talk a little bit about this. So we have a World Vision Times that we do, uh, we do on every year where we curate stories in the field and bring them uh, through this particular uh, direct mailer. So this will be, this is, we are in the process of putting this together and this will be sent to uh, your homes in August. So look out for it. It should be coming soon uh, into your homes in the mid-August timeframe. So thank you very much once again, uh, really on behalf of all of us at World Vision Singapore, thank you very much for your time and also thank you very much for your support. Faith. Thank you, Lillian. Uh, once again, thank you, Lauren and Ivan, for the very insightful sharing. Um, you know, because we're so blessed living in this part of the world, we often forget about the plight of many children and families living in very harsh realities. Uh, to them, you know, what we see on the news and we hear from today's session is something that they have to deal with um, on a daily occurrence. So we want to again thank you um, for sponsors like yourself for choosing to sponsor a child or give towards our cause. It's because of partners like you that we can deliver life-saving aid, dignity and hope to more than 1 million children and adults in the most dangerous places by 2023. Before we end the session, we hope that you can fill in a feedback poll that should be popping up in front of your screen at uh, this moment. This will allow us to improve on our future events and webinar sessions. Yeah. So once again, if you are keen to find out more on how you can help, please do not hesitate to WhatsApp us at 69220144 or scan the QR code. Um, we will be more than happy to assist you. So thank you for attending um, our webinar session tonight. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Good night.